we've been in a series called King Size Lessons. And I don't know if you've been enjoying this series, and if you haven't been a part of this series at all, that means that you hadn't been to church in six weeks, okay? <laughs> all right, we've been in this series for a minute, okay? And it's been so good. It's been amazing. In week one, Pastor John kicked off, he talked about Saul, and he talked about his insecurities. Then he went on in week two, and he talked about David and the heart that we need to have. In week three, he talked about King Solomon and how we should need wisdom in our life. Week four, I know many of you remember this one. This is Pastor Larry preaching on King Hezekiah, right, and trusting in the Lord. In week five, Pastor Jonathan talked about the Boams, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and we learned so many lessons there. And last week in week six, Pastor Jonathan spoke about King Uzziah and the perils of pride. Such a convicting message, but a message that we all needed. Can somebody say amen? amen? You almost should give me a hand clap for remembering all those right there. You don't have to. You don't have to. But all of that leading up to this week, which is week seven, and we're going to be talking about King Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. I want to encourage any couple, if you're pregnant right now and you have a son on the way and you're trying to figure out a name for your son, <laughs> maybe Jehoshaphat could be a great name for your son. Maybe. I don't know. Well, we're going to learn some great things from King Jehoshaphat. And one of the things that we're going to learn from him, there's, there's these two battles that he's involved in. That, that are really highlighted in his life. And the title of today's message is Strategies for Battle. Strategies for Battle. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing. God, I pray, Father, that you would speak to your people. God, I pray, Father, that you would do something great in the lives of your people. God, I thank you, Father, that you would speak through me to your people with clarity. And God, you would produce fruit 30, 60, and a hundredfold, and that you and only you would get the praise and the glory for it. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen and amen. A few weeks ago, I was talking with someone, and they asked me a question. And they said, Pastor Wayne, have you ever thought about joining the armed forces? And I thought to myself, I don't know. No, I don't think I ever joined, thought about joining the armed forces. Maybe when I was younger. Maybe I thought about it then, um, but as I've gotten older, maybe not. And I wondered why they asked me that question. I was wondering, maybe should I have joined the armed forces? Did I miss my call? Or should I have been doing something else? But I knew that I, 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 was, I know that I'm in the right place and in the right season, because even though I didn't join the armed forces of America, I'm in the army of the Lord. Can somebody say amen, right? But I'm very grateful for those who serve our country, and I'm so honored to, to talk about them because they're, they're, they do such great things. And I think we ought to put our hands together and thank God for those who do serve our country. So appreciative. Although I never thought about joining the armed forces, I'm very fascinated by um, World War II. I'm a history buff. I actually love learning and studying World War II and all the things that happened there. And so I, I watch documentaries and I read things about it. I'm very intrigued. I, I was even thinking about last week in June 6th where we celebrated D-Day and how we landed on Normandy, the 80th anniversary of that. And I, I was just constantly just thinking about it. And as I think about that particular war, the thing that comes to mind is that that war wasn't won accidentally. Okay, there wasn't, we didn't win that war accidentally. That war was won because of very strategic maneuvers and moves and planning that allowed us to win that war. Can somebody say amen? amen. It was strategic. It took thought. It took planning. Somebody had to know at this moment, this day, it's when we're going to move. This is when we're going to bomb. This is when people are going to land. And those strategic moves allowed there to be victory for, for our country. Now, as I begin to think about that, I begin to think, you know, there's people that are walking through battles in our lives and right now. And some of you, you're walking through battles and you're going through different things and you're trying to figure out how do I get the victory in this battle? It's going to take strategy. It's going to take strategy. It's not just about just saying, I just want to get out of this battle and I just want to win it. I believe that it's going to take strategies for you to win 
the battle. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 for me real quick. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 says this, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all what? Say that a little bit louder. All what? Strategies. Strategies of the devil. Hmm, let's stop right there. Now, if the enemy has strategies to try to take you out, that means that we need to have even better strategies in order to emerge victorious. Can somebody say amen? Amen. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. So we need to know that, there are, that we need to have strategies and, strategies, and we need to also know who we're fighting, okay, who we're coming up against. So the goal of this message to do, is to do three things. Number one, identify what battles you're in. That's important. The second thing I want us to do is I want us to understand how we entered into those battles. How do we get there? Where did those battles stem from? How did they even start? And the final thing we want to do is that we want to figure out how we can emerge victorious. Amen? Are you guys ready to go on this journey? All right, so let's talk about Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was a great king. If you don't know much about him, he was a great king. You can read a lot about him in 2 Chronicles chapter 17 through about 2 Chronicles 21. And you can see his life. And I have studied and poured over his life. And there were so many great things about Jehoshaphat. His dad was Asa the king. And he, he did so many great things for, the, for the, um, the, the nation of Judah. He was actually the fourth king in Judah. And he did amazing things. He fathered the nation of Judah. He, he tore down Asherah poles. He tore down um, um, shrines. He did so many things. He appointed judges and told them to rule with integrity. He even ta- told his officials to go into the community and teach the book of the law, the word of God, so they could know it. He did so many great things. He was a great king. The Bible says that he was committed to the Lord. You can tell as you read through the kings, there were some kings who were great kings and did evil in the Lord's sight, and there were some who did great things in the Lord's sight. Jehoshaphat did good things in the Lord's sight. Even as I read that, the two things that are highlighted the most are these two battles that he walks through, that he's in. As you read his story, the things that stick out the most are these two battles. And as I was reading this, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and told me this and to tell you this, is that even though you can be committed to the Lord and doing what's right and doing good things for the Lord, it doesn't mean that you will not walk through battles. I think it's important for me to tell you this because I think there may be a myth of, hey, give your heart to Jesus, serve the Lord with all that you have, and nothing bad will ever happen. It will always be sunshine and bluebell ice cream and everything will be great all the time. I wish I could tell you that, but that is not true. At some point, you will walk through a battle. Somebody told me you either coming out of a battle, presently in a battle, or guess what? You headed to a battle. Okay? So it's important for us to know this and understand that, that, that you go through these battles. And Jehoshaphat, doing so many great things for the Lord, still went through some battles. So you need to know this. So what is a battle? Okay, this is important for us to know. So I wrote down a definition. Now, this is from the Wayne Brown Dictionary, okay? <laughs> what is a battle? A battle is any obstacle that continues to exist despite adhering to God's principles and prevents you from fulfilling his intended purpose for your life, okay? That's what this is. That's what a battle is. Any obstacle that continues to persist after adhering to God's principles. Now, I put that in on purpose because there will be things that will come your way But if you apply God's word, some of those things you can get just by applying God's word. You can get the victory just by putting his word in place. There's sometimes people walk through things and they think it's a battle, but you're not applying God's word. And so it's really not a battle. You just being disobedient. Okay. I've been doing this for a little while. And so sometimes people come to me and they say, Pastor, pray for me. And I'm walking through some financial battles. One of the first things I ask them, I say, hey, are you tithing? 
And they go, no. I said, well, you're not in the battle. You got to start tithing and get under the blessing. I knew I would only get three amens right there. I knew it. I knew it. See, we've got to apply God's principles. And when we do that, there still will be moments where you will go through battles. But if you're applying God's principles, you can sometimes just get the victory by just applying his, his principles. But it doesn't mean that you're still, that you're still, that you won't go through battles. So that's what a battle is. Sometimes you're doing it and you keep coming up against it. Now, this is important to identify battles because sometimes you're walking through things and you don't even identify it as a battle. You may consider it, oh, this is just a bad habit. Oh, this, this little thing, oh, this is just a little, little struggle that I'm dealing with. It's, it's really not that big of a deal. You know, I, I, you know I, it's just one little drink every now and then. I, I can stop any time I want to. It's just a little something that I do. Okay? Well, stop then. Well, I could stop if I wanted to, but I just every now and then I feel like I just need a little something to keep me going. It's just a little depression. It's just a little. Let me just tell you something. Hey, it's a battle. And we need to identify it as a battle because what the enemy would love for you to do is to not think it's a battle so you will never really deal with it. Well, catch what I'm saying right here. This is important because a lot of times we just minimize things and just say it's not that big of a deal. No, it is a big deal, and we need to attack this thing and get victory in it in Jesus' name. So we have to identify what those battles are. Now, it's important for you to understand why does the enemy come after you is because he wants territory. Just about every battle that, that, that happens and exists is really about gaining access in territory. Right? And so what the enemy wants to do is that he wants access and territory in your life. You say, well, why is the enemy coming after my mind? It's because he wants access and territory in your mind. Because if he can get in your mind, he can run havoc all through your mind. And all the time you're walking through fear and anxiety, it's because the enemy wants territory. And we have to understand and say, no, no, enemy, you're not going to gain territory in my mind, in my family, in my finances, in my health. You're not gaining territory in my life. Can somebody say amen? amen. But see, we have to identify these battles that we're walking through so we can be able to address them and emerge victorious. Now, how do battles start? Well, I'm glad you asked. Thank you. <laughs> battles start from several different things. Now, the one thing that I noticed about Jehoshaphat's life is in 2 Chronicles 18 and 2 Chronicles 20, we're going to talk about these two battles that he's in, but in both battles, neither one did he initiate. He didn't start either one. He just found himself in a battle. Have you ever just found yourself in a battle? Just all of a sudden, you just go, where did this come from? Like, life was great. I was serving God. I was doing my thing. Then all of a sudden, this thing just hit our family. Where did it come from? Well, let me give you a couple of places it could have came from. You ready? Write this down. Number one, some battles are generational. Some battles that you're dealing with right now didn't start from you. It started about three generations ago. Yeah. It's something that great-grandfather dealt with, yeah. and then grandfather dealt with, and then your father dealt with it, and now all of a sudden it's coming up in you, and you're wondering, where is this even coming from? It's because nobody dealt with it back then, and they didn't win the battle back then, and so now you're dealing with it right now. Yeah. Ooh, this is good right here. Yeah. You have to be able to identify where these battles come from. Some of you don't believe me. Let me show you in Scripture. So you know Abraham. Abraham was a great man of God. We love Abraham. He was the father of many nations. Abraham had one little thing, though, one little thing. He was a deceiver. Amen. Right? Because he had this moment where he had to identify that, this is his, that his wife was his wife or his sister. And what did he do? He lied and said, this is my sister. Okay? Yeah. All right? Not a problem. It's no big deal. It's just a little deception, just a little bit. But if you move on, he had a son named Isaac, and Isaac got in the same situation. Yeah. 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 And what did Isaac do? He lied and said, this is not my wife. This is my sister. Yeah. So a little bit of deception here, a little bit of deception here. Then Isaac has a son named Jacob. You know what Jacob means? 
deceiver. Wow. So we go from one little thing here not being dealt with to all of a sudden this is his identity. You wonder why the Lord said, I have to change your name from Jacob to Israel because I've got to break this cycle. This thing is not going to continue going on. You will no longer be Jacob. You will now be Israel. And somebody in the room today, you need to break the cycle in your family. Yeah, Yeah, you've been struck. Yeah, there was divorce and dysfunction four generations ago. But you know what? Somebody needs to step up and say, not in my family. It's not going to happen anymore. It's stopping right now. I want to talk to some dads. Happy Father's Day. I want to talk to some dads. Dads, it's important. Some of the battles you're walking through right now, it's important that you get the victory for your family. It's important that you get the victory so it doesn't continue to pass on to your sons and to your daughters. Some of you need to stop the thing right now in your family. There are things that I do not struggle with because my dad got the victory. I don't, I'm not even tempted by it because my dad got the victory and got the, and won the battle. There are things I do battle with that it is important that I deal with so my son doesn't battle it. So, Dad, I want to lean in just for a moment and tell you, get the victory in these areas. Yes. Don't minimize it. Don't just push it off and say it's no big deal because it will pass on from generation to generation. Come on, I'm teaching some good stuff in here right now. The second thing, the second way you can get into a battle is by association, okay? So Jehoshaphat gets in an alliance with King Ahab. This is in in 2 Chronicles 18. There's an alliance he gets in with Ahab because he allows his son to to marry Ahab's daughter. They get into this alliance, and Ahab decides he wants to go into battle and he wants to attack the Syrians because he wants to, to reclaim Ramoth Gilead because ben, King Ben-Hadad didn't give it to him when he was supposed to. So he decides to go into battle. And all of a sudden, Jehoshaphat is in this battle with King Ahab. King Ahab is the same King Ahab like Jezebel King Ahab, right? Same King Ahab. He gets in battle in alliance with him. And all of a sudden, he finds himself in a battle, not something he initiated, it's just something by association. Some of the battles that you're in right now are battles that are not from you, it's it's because of somebody you're connected to. I want you to think about that for a moment. Think about that. It's It's something that you're connected to. Sometimes we have friends and people that we're around, and it's like, man, why am I dealing with all of this anxiety and depression? You know what? If I think about my friend and this friend and that friend and that friend, they're all dealing with depression and anxiety, and all of a sudden, now you're dealing with depression and anxiety. And that's why it's important for you to know who you're connected to so you don't get yourself in battles that you shouldn't be in. That's why I believe in B groups. I believe in B groups because when I can get around the right people, then we can all get the victory together. If they're getting victory, then I can get victory. And when they go through something, I can go through it with them. And when I go through something, they can go through something with me. But we're all trying to go on the right track, and we're all trying to serve Jesus together. Am I making sense right now? That's why I'm very... I'm very cautious who I'm connected to. Because listen, I got enough battles on my own. I don't need to be trying to fight your battles, get myself in stuff, right? It's important. And I want to just tell this to all the single people, be careful who you marry. Yeah, because when you marry somebody, you get all their battles too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That should make you happy right there, doesn't it? But sometimes you get in battles by association. The last thing is that you get in battles just because it's the enemy. Yeah, Yeah, you do have an adversary. And there's sometimes it's not generational. And it's not by association. Some of it can be just straight the enemy just coming after you. He's just coming after you because he doesn't like you. And he wants to attack you. 
This, this other battle that Jehoshaphat is in, he's minding his business. And all of a sudden, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Minyanites, they just decide to gather together and march against, the king, march against Judah. And all of a sudden, Jehoshaphat is like, I didn't even do anything. And they're just coming after him. Sometimes the enemy just wants to come after you and attack you. And you need to know that. It's important that you know it so you can know how to attack. Am, am I making sense? Yeah. Right? I think about Pastor Larry. Listen, the battle that Pastor Larry has walked through has not been something of generational or by association. It's just the enemy didn't like him and just wanted to attack him. But by him knowing that, he knew how to pray, and we all knew how to pray so we can get the victory in that situation. Can somebody say amen? Amen. So you have to know where the battles are coming from. Now, finally, you need to understand how do you emerge victorious? Well, I'm glad you asked that as well. Let me give you these two battles and how to emerge victorious. So you got battle one, the one he's in with Ahab. And one of the things that I love Jehoshaphat did in both battles, he, first thing he said is he said, what does the Lord have to say about this? We want to go in the battle, that's great, Ahab, but what does the Lord have to say about it? Let me just tell you this. Before you go in the battle, you need to seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. You can write that down. You need to seek the Lord before you go into battle because some of us, we always want to talk to everybody else and talk to all kind of people, but we need to talk to the Lord about what's going on in our situation. Well, the first thing we do, we're on the phone, we're texting, we're in somebody's chat, and we're doing all these things, but we've got to start seeking the Lord and see what does he have to say about the matter. In battle two, the same thing happens. He hears that these, these armies are coming against him, and he says, hey, let's seek the Lord. He begins to beg and cry unto the Lord to see what the Lord has to say. Yeah. And that's what we have to do. We have to start going to him first. Seek him first, the kingdom of God. We have to seek him. It's important. The second thing that I notice that happens is in this battle, when they sought the Lord, this prophet Micaiah comes up and says, Ahab, you will surely die in this battle. Okay? Now, this is not a good thing for Ahab. He doesn't like it. He actually puts him off in prison. And what he says is, is that when he goes into battle, Ahab disguises himself like a regular soldier. And he tells Jehoshaphat, put on your kingly robes and and armor, and that way they'll come after you and not me. Boy, that's really nice. (laughs) And Jehoshaphat does it, okay? He puts on his kingly armor, and they do. They start coming after Jehoshaphat. But he put on his kingly thing. Now, what I look at that and I see is that Jehoshaphat decided he was going to win this battle in the natural, okay? Okay? And there's many times we get in situations and we think, you know what, I'm going to win this battle in the natural. Somebody says something about me and they've been talking about me at work, at work. you know what, I got something, I'm going to say to them. And I'm going to go win this battle in the natural. But can I just tell you something? You can't win every battle in the natural. Now, what Jehoshaphat did was that he learned something from that because they started coming after him and he ended up having to cry out to the Lord. But in this battle, when he heard that they were coming against him, he called a time of prayer and fasting because he understood that I can't win this thing in the natural. I have to win it in the spirit. It's not by power and it's not by might, but by your spirit, says the Lord. See, it's important for us to know that we've got to win battles in the spirit and not in the natural. He had to put on the right armor. This is strategies for battle. Seek the Lord. Put on the right armor. Then finally, I love this, you have to allow the Lord to fight your battles. You do. There's some battles you have to fight, but there's some you need to let the Lord just fight it for you. See, he gets in battle one. And the Syrian king had gave orders, hey, go after the king. I want the king of Israel to be dead. I'll go after him. And they start, because they see Jehoshaphat in his kingly armor, they start going after him. And Jehoshaphat cries out to the Lord, and the Lord saves him and gets him out of it. The Lord was the one who pulled him out of that battle. The Lord saved him. Then over here, I want to read to you what happened in this particular battle in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15. There was a, 
one of the men, after they called a time of prayer and fasting, one of the men stepped up. His name was Jehaziel. I think, that, I think he was a brother. I do. I think I have a cousin named Jehaziel. Maybe I don't. I don't know. But Jehaziel said, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not even... You will not even need to fight. I love what he says right here. Take your positions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. I'm going to read that again. Take your positions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you. Oh, people of Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow for the Lord is with you. Allow the Lord to fight your battle. He told him to do three things. He said, take your position. Listen, can I just tell you something? When you get in battle, a lot of times we say, well, okay, the Lord's going to fight for me, but it doesn't mean that you don't have to still take your position. That means that you still need to show up for the battle. And when you take your position, that position of prayer and praise, what you're saying to the enemy is that I'm not intimidated by you. Devil, bring it on. I'm not scared of you because the Lord is with me. And greater is he that's on the inside of me than he that is in the world. And so you know what? When I walk through battles, I'm going to take my position. I'm going to stand right here, and I'm not going to weep, and I'm not going to cry. I'm going to take my position and tell the devil, bring everything you got, because God is with me. Is there somebody in the room today that's realizing that you need to take your position? Not cry and run and, and, and hide and duck somewhere. You say, no, devil, I'm going to take my position in my family. I'm going to take my position in my health. And I'm going to stand here, and devil, you can hit me all you want, but I'm going to get right back up and I'm going to stand again. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost on that. Too often do we run. Then I love that he says, he said, take your position. Then he say, and stand still. Just stand right there. Just, just stand right there. Just be planted. I see too many people, something happened at church, somebody looked at them wrong in church, and they said, I need to go find me another church because I don't like what's going on. No, the Lord will say, stay planted. Something happened in your marriage, and you say, I think I need to go find me another marriage. No, you need to stay planted right there. Stand still. Can I just tell you something? I don't care if hell and high water come against my marriage, I'm going to stay planted in my marriage. I've been planted for 17 years, and I'm not going anywhere else. I'm just going to stand still right here. I'm not going. CC want to leave? I'm going to follow you. We're not going anywhere. I'm standing still. That's what somebody needs to do. Stand still and watch. Watch what the Lord does. If you hang around long enough, you will see with your own eyes how God will give you the victory. Too often do we move too quick. We've been, Pastor, I've been standing for five years, staying for another five years. My kids are away from the Lord. That's all right. Keep standing. Keep taking your position. Keep standing. Keep declaring the word of the Lord over them and watch the fruit come back. It will come back. Take your position. Stand still and watch what the Lord does. I'm going to close with this story. I've been to Puerto Rico four times. This, this, this April was my fourth time there. And I'm so glad because Pastor Cameron and Pastor Melissa are actually in the States right now. And they've been here for, for a few days for the conference and all of that. And when we go there, we go to a place down in, 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 in San Juan called Old San Juan. Old San Juan, there's so much history there. It's right near the coast, very touristy area. There's statues, there's all sorts of things, buildings, old buildings, forts, so many things that are there. I've been there all four times, but this is the first time I had a tour of this area. 
a native, a resident of Puerto Rico, said, we're going to do a prayer walk through old San Juan, and I'll tell you about certain things that are here. She brought us by this one statue called La Rogativa. And we walked up to the statue, and she began to tell us the story about the statue there. And I remember to hear, hear, hearing that story and going, oh, my gosh, this is important. The story goes like this. In 1797, a British commander began to put together a naval blockade to get ready to attack and siege the island of Puerto Rico. It was a huge naval blockade. And they had more than enough to win the battle. And they, so they started, they got out into the waters and they began to get ready to come in. And as they were there, the governor of Puerto Rico, in desperation, didn't know what to do. He knew he didn't have an army to beat him. He knew he didn't have enough resources to beat him. So what he did is that he called a rogativa. Now, what a rogativa is, it's a prayer processional and a plea to God for help. So what he did was that he went and he found the bishop. And the bishop found a few ladies, and they began to get some torches and some bells, and they began to walk up the streets of old San Juan and begin to pray and begin to seek God. They knew that they couldn't beat them. They knew that they didn't have enough to win the battle, but they knew that they had a God on their side. And so as they were walking and praying, the British commander saw them walking around, and it was just a few of them, but what he thought was that that was signaling that reinforcements were on the way. And so the entire British troop turned their boats, and they all left and retreated in fear because they thought, oh, my gosh, they've got reinforcements on the way. When what it showed to me was this is that, you know what, they did have reinforcements on the way. They had heavenly reinforcements on the way. And it showed to me that all it takes is a bishop and some ladies to get to walking around praying, and it ran off the entire army. Some people who were willing to stand up and take their position and not run from the enemy, but walk right to them and say, we're gonna pray because we know we have a God on our side, and he is with us and he's for us. I want to know if there's anybody in the room today that's been walking through a battle that realized you need to take your position. You need to start to stand still and watch what God is doing and begin to plead to God for help because I believe that when you do it, he will stand with you and you will emerge victorious. Can somebody say amen? Amen. It will happen. You know, I believe today as I was praying, there are some people in here. I want you to know that there is a battle for your soul. Look, the enemy doesn't like you. And like I said earlier, there, there is an adversary against you. And he doesn't want you to make it to heaven. And I don't know how you ended up in here today, but I believe that the Lord drew you in here today because he wants you to come to him. And I have a faith in my spirit today. There's going to be some people in this room that you've been away from God. You've been backslidden and you've gotten away from him. And I'm telling you today, you're going to get the victory today. You're going to give your heart to Jesus. Because you're tired of going back and forth with the enemy. You're ready to see some victory in your life. The reason why I know is because I felt that exact same way. I've been there where I felt like there was defeat after defeat after defeat. And I knew that the Lord was pulling and tugging on me. And when I gave my heart to the Lord, immediately I began to see victory in my life. Has life been perfect? No, it hasn't. Yes, there have been battles, but I know that I'm not fighting by myself now. I know that I have the Lord on my side. And with him, I win every single time because he never fails.